Now, you were the architect of the uh, $7 Medicare home payment that was announced in the, the first hockey budget of 2014. And uh, I've heard you speak and you say uh, that you're a uh, self-confessed uh, failure uh, on, on this issue. Um, why did it uh, fail? Uh, was it the, the politics of the day or the uh, sales pitch? Uh, uh, and what can we learn from uh, uh, this episode? Well, I don't like being described as the architect of the government's $7 GP co-payment, Tim, because I wasn't. Um, what I did was advocate in a policy paper uh, for a think tank uh, uh, that to, you know, to, to simply look at whether the Hawke government's 1990s uh, GP co-payment updated to 2013 at that stage, which uh, meant a $6 uh, per visit co-payment could actually work. And I suggested a framework in which it could work. Um, but uh, because of budget speculation in 2013-14, it took on a life of its own. And it, as it turned out, the government itself was doing its own work behind the scenes and leaving uh, yours truly to go out there and advocate the, the, the cause and be like the canary in the coal line and see if I dropped off the perch. and. Uh, uh, and, you know, I'd like to think I did OK in, in the debate and uh, I didn't drop off the perch. But the problem was that what the government introduced uh, was politically unrealistic in policy terms. It didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve, which was to send a price signal in re relation to going to the GP. Um, and the main reason for doing that, uh, that I say that, is that what they did was put it into this hypothecated medical research fund, and which was totally out of the blue. Uh, and nobody could actually sort of see what benefit for them of doing that was. So, and 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 as I said before, there was a there is a slippery slope uh, argument that's always put about when it comes to Medicare, full stop, and bulk billing in particular. You know that uh, if you start doing this, then you're just going to go all the way and get rid of Medicare altogether, which is wrong. Uh, but that's what uh, the opponents of change actually want you to believe, whether they're people in what I, I call the Medicare establishment, you know, the, the doctors, the AMA, um, uh, health policy experts or self-appointed health policy experts, um, and of course, uh, politicians who want to score populist points by opposing uh, a change to what is seen as a popular system. I mean, in, a sec in effect, what the government what Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey particularly, and also Peter Dutton didn't realise was that um, any changes to Medicare were like killing Bambi and uh, you just don't announce them. You actually, you need to actually bring people along with you. You need to be able to explain the benefits of change and you don't do that after it's actually brought down in as a centrepiece of a big saving budget as they did in 2014. You actually, um, you actually gradually make the case um, inform people about why some change is necessary, uh, what benefits the change will bring, and, and, and make people realise that the world was not going to end. And one of the interesting things, Tim, is that when this debate was really going, uh, people came up to me who are frequent flyers in the system, you know, the elderly, pensioners, uh, uh, people with young children, um, and, and said, um, yeah, good on you. I mean, that uh, this is actually something that we don't mind paying, say, $6 a visit for because uh, we get such good care from our GPs that we want to actually contribute to that and make sure that they continue to provide a quality service. So, if, in effect, they understood what the price signal was all about. It was the vested interests and the, and the, the political opponents who actually tried to and successfully take it, it did take it apart. And it was also um, the, the fact of the, the politics of the issue, the fact that it was viewed as a, uh, a broken promise. And also they, they just announced it on a budget night. There, was, there wasn't any sort of soft, uh, uh, soft diplomacy in the months leading up to the budget where this is uh, what, what we might do. So it wasn't that I felt that the co-payment itself was rejected, but it, as always, it's the ability to sell it and politi politically manage it. Well, that's right. I mean, as I said before, I was the canary in the coal mine in the run up to the 2014 budget because uh, I was the one that ended up carrying the debate because the government did not put their toe in the water, really. Um, I guess they wanted to keep their own uh, position under wraps. But as I said before, I mean, the fact that I survived in that debate probably emboldened them politically to say, oh, well, look, I think we can do this. But 
uh, it's a bit of a difference when uh, a former uh, Howard government advisor writing a paper for a think tank says something as to when the Treasurer of the Commonwealth of Australia in the, the first budget after an election says it. And, and as you say, rightly point out, it wasn't, actually it wasn't a broken promise at all uh, because it wasn't cutting Medicare, um, but it was certainly out of the blue. Uh, people weren't expecting it. They certainly weren't expecting it on the scale that they were doing and they did not expect it would be linked to a never, never medical research fund that had no real practical, tangible here and now benefit to the consumers, you know, the, the punters who are being expected to pay the co-payment. If they knew that it was going, say, into um, hospital infrastructure or uh, equipment infrastructure or doctors and nurses even, uh, uh, particularly, you know, if you look at it in terms of what uh, uh, Medicare rebates are paid, if it was actually being reinvested in higher rebates, uh, that could have been sold and could have been sold really well. But the bottom line is that before the budget, the government did not sell at all and after the budget it did not sell well. And when things got tough for it pretty well straight away, they got they dug their heels in. They didn't actually ask them the question sells the question, can we actually improve this proposal and make it work? And there were ways and means of doing that, um, but uh, effectively what happened was that the government, you know, the coalition government, allowed its opponents to call the shots. And I'm not meaning the Labor Party as much as the Australian Medical Association and its allies. I mean, uh, I said when the co-payment went down in 2015 and both Tony Abbott as Prime Minister and Bill Shorten as opposition leader said, in, in future we will not make significant changes to Medicare without ensuring the doctors and the Australian Medical Association are on board. I, I said that effectively that makes the national president of the AMA the de facto health minister of Australia and uh, in many ways, I, look I don't think that's changed. If anything, uh, I think uh, the current government has got to uh, reform shy when it comes to, to, to um, the health system as a whole, though it is doing some reasonable things in terms of reviewing the Medicare schedule and private health insurance. But the Labor Party has basically gone totally populist. So pop so populist in the 2016 campaign, of course, we had the Medi scare about the alleged privatisation of Medicare, but they, they you know, talked about, you talk about broken promises in 2013. I mean, effectively, Bill Shorten promised that if we, or we phrased his promise in such a way that if Labor comes in and cuts just $1 out of Medicare, he's broken that promise. That's how ironclad it was and how therefore practically stupid it was. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, eventually Tony Abbott declared that the Medicare co-payment was dead buried and uh, cremated, which is also what he said about uh, uh, work choices. So it does, as with uh, workplace laws, does this make future uh, health reform free market reform more difficult to achieve because the, the coalition has now had this bad experience with the Medicare uh, co-payment and you know, incurring the wrath of, yeah, as you mentioned, not just Labor, but the um, Medical Association makes them more timid to tackle this issue in the future? Yes, I think that's right. Uh, from the government sort of the coalition side, they are now reform averse or reform shy in healthcare. But I think Greg Hunt, the current health minister, is doing a reasonable job doing pushing through what he thinks he can get through. Uh, and that's really, I suppose, politics, they say, is the art of the possible. But from the from the left side, uh, they're so they were so absolute in their opposition and they've, as I, as I was saying before, effectively have painted themselves into a corner with their rhetoric so that um, they're not uh, going to uh, do anything bold in terms of uh, structural reform of Medicare uh, without losing a lot of political capital if they manage to uh, win the next election because they promised people so absolutely that uh, not a hair on the Medicare head will be touched that there's really given themselves no room to move and and frankly I, I think the, the, the result of this as far as health policy goes is that uh, policy is not dictating the terms of engagement, populism is, and that's what Bill Shorten has, has, has cottoned on to, and I suspect that's where the coalition will go in terms of uh, minimising any change. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.